to this talk. So uh, what I wanted to uh, do today is to talk a little bit about the background of the project um, and also my own background, uh, which is very connected uh, with, uh, with, with this work. Um, and um, this particular exhibition is a collaboration also with a voiceover act, um, actor here, Verity Kirk, who um, very beautifully enacted the, the writing that inspired me to do the, the, the photography uh, part of it. Um, so we will, at some point will listen to, to one of the recordings. Um, and before I start, I just wanted to say, to please interrupt me at any point of time. I'll be happy, very happy to take questions. Also, I can answer any questions. So there will be, a, uh, there will be also an opportunity at the end. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, whatever comes to mind, uh, uh, do ask. Um, so my, um, my, my background is actually in literature. I studied uh, back in Poland, I'm Polish myself. Um, uh, literature and linguistics at the University of Gdańsk, um, uh, and then I um, was very much interested in photography, but started photography when I came over here, and I've been here for nearly 20 years. Um, and one thing I need to reveal is actually my connection with this uh, with this place. So this uh, beautiful gallery, before it became a gallery, uh, used to be a bookshop. Um, and uh, before I was uh, a photographer, I used to organise evenings with authors. Uh, particularly uh, authors of Polish um, extraction whose work was translated into English. Uh, so I was um, hosting two events here, uh, one with a poet, one with a crime writer, um, and uh, later on the poet was also available to be photographed because at that, that point I was making this transition from the um, uh, kind of wor world of words to a world of images. Um, and I photographed him downstairs in the cellar, in the dark, with bits of his text <laughs> projected on his body. Uh, so that was supposed to be a series um, entitled Poetry Reading, which um, just started but no, was never completed. Um, because I was really drawn by, by working on this project. I mean, this project is, um, has taken me um, in total seven years, um, because there was quite heavy research. Um, Phase involved um, at the beginning, and then I was uh, taking the photographs, and then I worked for three years on the book. So the book is here, if you'd like to have, have a look at, uh, at it later. But um, how it started, um, it actually the, the, uh, the very beginning started with this book. Um, because I used to organize evenings um, or meetings with, with authors of, um, um, with some kind of connection with Poland, I was contacted by a person who published this book, um, and this is a Polish book um, called um, Mada, Matka and Other Writings, um, and it's the very first and only, really, um, publication by, of works by Sophie Gwiebrzewska, whom I got really interested in, and who's, um, to whose archive I responded photographically here. So the person who uh, published this book, Marta, is now a film producer. Um, she and she 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 found out about Sophie through film because there was a film made in 1970s by Ken Russell about Sophie and her partner Henri. Um, so Martha really wanted me to organise an evening, presumably here, <laughs> uh, uh, about this book. But this book is in Polish, um, so obviously the audience for that uh, meeting will be very limited. And by the time this book arrived, I managed to. Google up the original publication in English because that's a Polish translation, um, which was done by a gallerist um, who unfortunately uh, passed away last year. Um, and she used to uh, trade um, sculptures by uh, Sophie's partner, Andrei Gowiadrzewska. And at some point she must have acquired manuscripts of her work. So then she sat down one winter and she transcribed the written word uh, and translated from French as well. And she did this beautiful publication, but in a very, very small edition of 120 copies, called Matka, which is Mother in Polish, and other writings. Um, so I managed to uh, find a PDF, and I read it, and it was really an incredible uh, discovery, because that text was not edited, um, which is very unusual to have something which is really raw um, and without any alteration. Uh, um, so Sophie's writing is very, it's quite modernist, it's quite unusual, very often she doesn't use any punctuation marks uh, apart from hyphens. Um, 
So sometimes it kind of lose track of who's saying what, because it's all one line <laughs> with dashes. <laughs> uh, whereas the Polish edition um, is, 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 is an edited version, so you'll see that uh, uh, commas and, and full stops. But the reason also why I brought this book um, is, uh, is the fact that it's very beautifully illustrated by, um, by works done by Henri. So there are portraits of Sophie, uh, um, her partner, um, and they're also uh, they writing, so I'll, I'll pass it around for you to, to see. I just wanted to find... So there is one sketch of Sophie, uh, done by Henri, uh, and he was incredible. He was a sculptor, but he was also really incredible um, at drawing. So he needed very few lines to uh, actually convey quite a lot. So this is Sophie reading. Um, um, and there are some coloured plates as well. So this is one of the portraits of Sophie. Um, and I really wanted to show it to you because it was also something about the image um, of Sophie. So her family um, uh, very often told her that she was very ugly. Um, whereas you can see from, 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 from uh, Henri's drawings and also from the only surviving photograph of Sophie that she was just the opposite. So that's that's Sophie's uh, uh, portrait um, uh, photograph. Sorry, portrait, and this is Henri. So when I read the publication, um, Master and Other Writings in English, um, I decided to go and see uh, other works by Sophie, and they are actually available in three collections in the UK, uh, at Cambridge University, at Essex University, and Kettle's Yard, and then one place in, in France. Um, so I'll show you just some examples of them. <laughs> it's all handwritten form, and the handwriting is quite neurotic. Um, and also Sophie was, was very poor, so she used every uh, scrap of paper, every avail available part of, of, of the paper to write. Um, it was also fascinating to see uh, um, how the text uh, developed. So she, if she wanted to add a paragraph or two, she would just cut out little bits and then staple them on top in those various <laughs> parts of, um, of, of, of the sheet. Uh, the sheets at the time were, were bigger, they were, they were slightly bigger than, or definitely longer than A4. Um, and there are very few, um, there are very few uh, pages which are actually type, uh, typewritten. So um, <coughs> it could have been the case that she wanted to show it to someone. I mean, she definitely showed her work to some of her work to Ezra Pound, uh, but I suspect that she might have shown him some of her short stories, which are actually which are type typewritten, um, which are very conventional in style. So maybe that's why nothing came uh, of it, uh, which was very disappointing to her. Um, so yeah, and, and also the the manuscripts, I mean, they're, they're really kind of visually very interesting, but some of them in a, are in a very bad condition. Um, so this one, for example, is affected by mud. There's quite a lot of them affected by mud and water. And then because she was writing um, with a pen in it, with ink, you know, some, some of the pages are, you know, you can see that the water has just gone through. And I mean, they're visually, they're absolutely beautiful, but a total nightmare to read. Um, um, oh yes, yeah, so this, this is how, this is her revised version of the novel. Maybe I'll just pass these round. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so it was, it was really, really fascinating to, to look at them, to read them. Uh, however, Sophie wrote in three languages, in Polish, her native Polish, uh, French, and English, and I can only handle two. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she wrote a novel of the French, a uh, language I don't know. Uh, so then I relied very heavily on friends, family, and translators um, to help me understand what these texts were, were all about. Um, so it was quite uh, it was quite fascinating to see how she actually moved from one language to, to another. It's quite unusual for a writer to uh, work in so many languages. I mean, typically you 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 will have your kind of linguistic home in one language, um, despite the fact that you can handle a few. But the kind of literary uh, wise, whereas she seemed to be switching and swapping with no effort, uh, which I found really remarkable. Uh, so very sometimes she would write a draft. Of something in one language and then a longer version of it in another 
or sometimes she'll be writing the same piece but in three languages. So Matka, um, which means mother, um, in Polish, that's actually written in three languages. Um, um, there is one photograph here, just um, here in the corner, uh, which shows you how she went about the drafts as well. So this is the very first draft of the novel, uh, which is written, which is written in uh, Polish called Hysterical Women. Uh, and she was unhappy with the first draft, she just she cut it out. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we know just the beginning and the end of it, but no, nothing uh, uh, about what was there in, in the middle. And then when I worked on my own book, um, which contains photography and Sophie's writing, then I really wanted to replicate that. So I'll just grab a copy and show you um, <clears throat> that um, uh, we really wanted to get kind of to give people a sense of what it was like to to go through Sophie's uh, text and obviously host the yellow because the, the, the pages are yellow, um, yellowed with time, and this is it. So that was kind of hand cut. So you don't know what the other part <laughs> of the letter says. Um, so I wanted to say a few, um, give, give a brief overview of Sophie's life, which was really fascinated by incredibly tragic. Um, so she was born um, uh, in a very rural place uh, in the south of Poland, so it's around 150 kilometers from Krakow. Going east, um, and at the time of her birth, uh, Poland did not exist as an independent country. Was divided into three um, three countries: so Russia, Prussia, and Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so the area where Sophie lived belonged to Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Sophie therefore had an Austrian passport, which was really important later on in life. Um, but as a as a child, she was. Um, you know, she's quite cut out, cut off the, the, the rest of the world because I mean, even nowadays it's very rural there. It's quite flat, so there are meadows um, around the manor house where she was born no longer exists. Um, uh, her mother came from nobility, but the family were not wealthy. Her, her father was a lawyer, and he was often away. Uh, he was running all sorts of legal practices, businesses. Uh, and then there was a land around, but the land was of the, the, the soil itself was a very very low quality, so they really they really couldn't profit from it. Um, and then at some point, the father uh, took a few loans from banks to invest in some kind of fertilizers, and that went really badly. So the family went bankrupt. Um, and then when I was trying to imagine what it must have, must have been like uh, to have the home and then lose it. So I did this photograph, which is a reflection in the um, in the in the puddle actually of a house, which is kind of there but no longer no longer there. So I spent quite a lot of time trying to track down if there was any archival uh, sketch or photograph of of the Dreski Manor House, but sadly I couldn't I couldn't find any. Uh, perhaps also because you know it wasn't an important location. Um, perhaps that's why it was not, not, never. Uh, never caught um, uh, by an artist or a photographer, um, and the family um, and the family was a kind of very very uh, con conservative family. Um, so the 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 so Sophie had four brothers, but there were nine siblings in total. On, only five of them survived in adulthood. So it was Sophie and her four brothers. Um, and the brothers were sent to study uh, first of all um, uh, in a boarding school, high school. Uh, and then uh, at the university, the various universities in Krakow and Lviv. Uh, and Sophie wanted to do the same, but she was never let to. Uh, so her mother had a very fixed idea what was uh, due to happen to her. So she wanted to marry Sophie off as soon as possible to a much older man. Uh, but then he asked for a, a dowry, um, quite substantial one, which the family could not provide. And they, and also the man was a, uh, was from a lower rank in society, and that they took incredible offence that he was asking <laughs> 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 um, for, for for that. Uh, so this um, arranged marriage marriage fell through, and Sophie was absolutely delighted because she hated the man. Um, <laughs> and then there was another attempt to do the same. So I was kind of trying to imagine what it must have been like for Sophie. So they. She was obviously introduced to the man, but very often there were photographs which were exchanged, you know. Uh, so I was trying to imagine that, and there was one uh, photograph of a man roughly from that area where with eyes scribbled out because obviously she was not, <laughs> not, not happy with that prospect. Um, 
Uh, and then, because of the family uh, financial difficulties and the fact that um, she had a very, very difficult uh, relationship with her mother here, and so you felt very strongly that she was not loved by, 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 by her mother and that um, uh, she was also disadvantaged in life by her because she didn't have to study. Uh, but she had to take uh, life in her own hands, uh, so she initially went to Krakow, then to Lviv, uh, and then off to Paris to find employment. Um, but her work opportunities were very limited um, due to lack of formal education, uh, professional connections, uh, and references. So she was only able to find uh, work as a governess, uh, as a nanny, uh, to wealthy families, uh, where she would spend a lot of time with the children, of taking her to different places, mending their clothes, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so she, it was not the job she really wanted. She didn't really like working with children, so it was, it was, it was very, very hard for her. Um, but she was very linguistically gifted, and she she really wanted to perfect French. She did some classes in French. Uh, there were some teachers coming to the house when she was younger. Um, uh, so then, eventually, when she had saved enough money from those little uh, jobs in professional places, she was able to go to Paris because also because her mother's brother lived there. Um, but she, Sophie was very disappointed, first of all, that there was so much poverty in the city because she thought, you know, there's a grand, uh, incredible urban space where she will be able to, to find good opportunities. And it was also very hard for her to find a job. Uh, and this is where Austrian passport came handy uh, because when she introduced herself to be a Pole, uh, she felt that, you know, no one was really giving her uh, that many um, uh, offers, job offers. Whereas when she presented herself to be an Austrian from Eastern provinces, that seemed to have helped <laughs> her a, a, a great deal. And then later on, she was taken on by an American family who used to visit Paris, I think, to, uh, every two years, to be the governess for their children. And they took her with her to Philadelphia. Um, so there, there when she, when she went there probably for around a year. So she, she came to, the States around 1900-1901 um, and then at some point she was no longer needed to work for that family and the mother of, of that family took her to New York and placed her in, um, in a really interesting institution which amazingly is still, is still going uh, called um, Jeanne d'Arc Residence which is on Lower Manhattan and it used to be, uh, well, it's still a kind of boarding house uh, for single women. It used to be specifically dedicated to French, uh, French arrivals, the French single women who wanted, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, come to New York and, and look for employment. Um, but they also needed to protect their reputation. So the institution was run by nuns. It's still run by nuns. Uh, and, and it's a really fascinating, it's quite a big building now, uh, so there are rooms, individual rooms, so no one is allowed to go uh, into that room, so you can't have any visitors. Um, and every time you go down and go somewhere else, uh, then you have to hand the key over to the, to the nun um, uh, and explain where you're going and roughly when you're coming back. So it's a very, <laughs> under very, very strict house rules, but at the same time, the the rent is just so incredibly cheap, so there is a lot of interest in that place. There are a lot of actresses that I met there who were going for houses in the afternoon, so you know it's a really prime location uh, in New York. So this is where Sophie stayed on and off at the beginning of the of the twentieth century, but she absolutely hated New York. Um, I mean, she didn't she didn't really um, she didn't really like the urban noise. Uh, I mean, New York must, you know, must have been an incredible construction project um, uh, then, so there must have been uh, a lot of that. Um, uh, and again, she found it quite hard to find jobs or to keep jobs. Um, also, there were jobs which she hated, so it was quite hard for her to actually stay, stay in one place. Um, and then at some point, she went back to Paris, uh, hoping to stay there forever, but that didn't work out. And she had to spend some time uh, at her mother's, <laughs> which was a very, very difficult uh, time for her. She also couldn't find employment in the local region. Um, and then, again, she thought to take hands, take life in her own hands, but in a kind of very extreme way. So she wanted to end her life in Paris. 
So she went back then in 1909, um, made arrangements, wrote her will, and I wanted to read out. Um, so, so that her will is um, is is also read out by Dorothy Kirk um, uh, at one, in one of the one of the codes. I'll point it out in a minute. Uh, but and you will see how little she possessed, how you know how few things uh, uh, she actually owned. Um, so she kind of disposes her properties. It says, um, consecutive order of the dispersal of my property. And there is a sum of 3,000 uh, 3, crown, which was the local currency, to be given to her brother. And there was one brother whom she felt very fondly uh, towards to, because he was also, um, he was also, uh, as she put it, persecuted by, by her mother. Um, and then, so she had uh, two $5 pieces, uh, she had cufflinks, gold pen, uh, and then silver pencil, which was given to her little brother, a pouch of crocodile skin, a silk parasol, um, a jacket and a muff, uh, little jars and postcards, and then lottery uh, tickets as well, which she was giving to her nephew. So there was very, very little, but I was quite... Um, I was quite touched by it, quite moved by it, and I, I remember the silk, you know, this little item of, um, of silk that she was given to a neighbour. Um, so when I was thinking of, like, of how to present these images, um, um, that, was always, that was always at the back of my mind. And I found a paper which has a kind of little, delicate, silky sheen to it. So I went for that, um, thinking that that will, that, that will somehow incorporate that little item that, that stuck in, in, in my mind from <coughs> Sophie's well. But Sophie didn't end her life there um, in, in Paris. She uh, actually uh, was quite invigor invigorated by the, by the environment there because she was surrounded by an um, international group of women who were doing courses at the Sorbonne. She herself found her, uh, her lodgings in the, on the left bank um, of the river, very close to Sorbonne. Um, so then she started doing, uh, she started attending, attending courses, uh, that, which, was, which was wonderful. Um, and she really felt that she was thriving there. And that's also the moment when she came across Henri, uh, who was uh, a young aspiring uh, artist. He really wanted to be a sculptor. Uh, he was nearly 19 years her junior. Um, and they became a couple. But Sophie made a condition. She said, I'm too old to be a lover, but I'm very happy to be your mother. Um, and <laughs> which is quite a new proposal. Um, but this kind of idea and, and the concept of a mother was really, really important in her writing and, and a kind of emotionally to Sophie herself because she had so much hatred towards her mother given her treatment. Um, she also felt that by being this kind of symbolic mother to Henri, she could help him out and help him become a, an artist. So she was kind of mothering him. But at the same time, when you read the letters, uh, the letter exchanges between them, sadly only Henri's uh, letters survived, um, you can see that she was um, sometimes using the same methods as her own mother was <laughs> applying to, apply to her. Uh, so she was very, very cautious and sometimes very mean in terms of money. Uh, and at some point, when they came to London uh, in 1911, they really, really struggled for jobs. I mean, they lived in horrible lodgings. Uh, very often they had to move from place to place. Uh, Sophie hated London, again, the noise, the kind of urban settings, the poverty uh, there. So she very often found refuge somewhere, somewhere else where she would work, again, as a teacher. Uh, very often she would present herself to be a French subject, so she was uh, to give, to give her to enhance her opportunities to become uh, to become a, a teacher of French, um, and, and and at some point Henri gave up his job, so he was working at uh, in in London where his linguistic skills were needed. So he himself spoke English. Uh, uh, he also learned Polish, and there was one um, piece of um, uh, a kind of little dictionary. So presumably Sophie was teaching. Henri Polish, and you could see by the type of words that she was teaching him that obviously she was still very angry about something, so there was struggle, battle, you know, that kind of words <laughs> appear, appear there, so it was really, really fascinating. 
uh, uh, to see. Um, and so, so it was it was hard for them to be together. It was also difficult for, for them to be apart. Um, and when Sophie, when Henri gave up his job um, in 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 London, then he was only reliant on Sophie in terms of the the financial provision. So it was quite hard. And Sophie could not forgive him for buying this or that. You know, in terms of uh, um, he, he needed uh, things to sculpt. You know, he needed material. So she always kind of controlled him in in in. in that way but at the same time uh, she really wanted him to uh, to achieve and, and he really, she really wanted him to do the best and luckily for him his career was set, was starting up um, uh, uh, at the beginning of 1910s uh, but sadly the first war broke out um, Sophie was really unhappy in Britain uh, I think she had a different idea of what this country how this country functioned and she also was disappointed by the lack of job opportunities. So she really wanted to relocate back in, to France. Um, but because Henri uh, escaped, avoided his military, obligatory military service, it was not really possible for him to go back. I mean, he, there was a, a threat of him being imprisoned. Um, so when the war broke out, they both felt that if he goes back and fights, uh, that will kind of open up the ability to return back together to, to France. Um, and also, ob obviously, at, the, at that time, no one realised how long the war will last for and how, how horrible and brutal it, it, its outcome will be. Um, so they obviously exchanged letters uh, while he, he was away. And so he felt really... I mean, she was very prone to, to low moods and she was also very prone to very high moods. Um, so it was when you read her prose you can ex experience very extreme emotions um, and while I'm talking about that I just felt that conveying the images in black and white would kind of fit that um, extremities of emotions and also extreme extremities of um, extreme extreme aspects of life as well like life and death you know blackness and, and whiteness uh, uh, something and nothing um, <clears throat> and uh, what happened was that um, at some point the fighting in France became very very fierce and uh, Henri wrote to Sophie to say that if he was ever to come back uh, he would like them to get married whereas Sophie felt that you know there was a totally ridiculous pr uh, proposal that wouldn't work. <laughs> um, one thing I should have said is that they exchanged surnames so very often people think they were actually married but they were not. Uh, so the, the exchange of surnames, Sophie was Dreska when she was born, Henri was Henri Godier and then they became Godier and uh, uh together. But they wanted, when they came to the UK they really wanted to, uh, to uh, have lodgings together and they came up with this idea that they were siblings, uh, sorry, uh, that they were, that Sophie was his half sibling, um, hence the same surname. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> um, and you know, it did work, they could <laughs> get rooms together and so on. Um, but Sophie rejected that proposal of marriage. Uh, and then a few days later, she wrote again, you know, much, in a much kind of kinder uh, way. But that le second letter that she wrote came back to her with a note saying that Henri died in fighting. So for the next, she lived for the next 10 years, but she lived with an incredible sense of guilt that she might have contributed to his death uh, because of what she wrote. Um, uh, and she, you know, she was in the <coughs> and then again, she really didn't like to be in a very uh, big urban setting. So she relocated to a town in Cotswolds called um, Watton Under Edge. And it's, it's really beautiful. It's down in the valley with hills. So she was very happy to go around uh, for walks, but all she really wanted to do her, uh, throughout her life was, was to write uh, and to become an independent writer. Um, but because of the financial uh, situation and the disadvantages, she never could, she could never <coughs> achieve that. Um, uh, so she felt that the only possibility for her to actually write is to do it at night. So she became a very nocturnal person. Um, so during the day she would sleep because there was a lot of noise, that the road was busy uh, in Watton and also she, at some point she acquired neighbours who had a child, a young child. So then that child was going up and down the stairs which was really disturbing her. Um, and, and then at night she was a nuisance to the neighbours because she would be cooking her dinner, she would be writing, so she would be making noise. 
um, and and also that there's the post-war um, uh, years in, in in Britain. You know, she obviously spoke of an accent when she spoke uh, in English. She when she registered in Wharton, she registered herself as a French subject, and then later on changed the registration to 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 reveal the truth that she was uh, Polish. Uh, but her neighbours suspected her of being German, <laughs> and obviously in the kind of post-world uh, uh, War I, uh, one era, you know that was not, you know that that was something to, to, uh, that meant that she was treated with grave suspicion uh, by her neighbours. Uh, she was also, you know, quite eccentric. Um, you know, walked in camp, unkempt uh, hair, muttering to herself. So it was she was clearly falling apart at that point. You know, she was really. Finding it very, very difficult, but writing was something that kept her going. Um, and I found her writing really, really moving. I mean, the fact that she could handle it in three languages, it's also very, very autobiographical. So you can actually extract uh, quite a lot of biographical details by reading her literary works. Um, she very often wrote or kind of described the domestic settings. Um, in, in great detail, like what was what, what was uh, terrible about it, or what was good about it. So I mean, she really had this kind of fixation with home because she never had a home by, um, herself. I mean, she had the, obviously the family manor house, which then the family lost, and her mother found uh, herself a different uh, space to live. But it's not that Sophie could go back to her and find refuge there. There was never there was never an option for her, although she did. Um, she did try it once and it didn't go down very well. Um, what I wanted to do now is to, uh, for us to listen to one of those recordings. So I really would like you to hear Sophie's voice. I think I have it now. So this piece comes from Matka. So, so this is the Polish translation. I didn't bring the, the, the original English one, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but she kind of tells... So the letter, she, she, she tells a story which is uh, written in the form of a letter to a French uh, uh, writer um, uh, who was also a Nobel Prize winner and who gave lectures on music at the Sorbonne. So that's the connection. This is how she came across him. Um,
my stupidity and my wickedness, which only existed as a result of the bad treatment. Yeah, that's, that's one of the pieces, so that's uh, <coughs> an excerpt from, from her autobiography, which she kept writing in, in, in three languages. Uh, so Sophie's end was very sad, she was forcefully taken to a mental asylum in Gloucester, and then she died two and a half years afterwards. Um, so when I was working on this project, I really wanted to somehow locate it in the past, but because, of the, because the writing is, you know, has such a contemporary feel to it, it's written in this kind of very direct, modernist way. I really wanted it to not, not, not to be a kind of a historical account, but to have a contemporary feel to it as well. Um, so I look for locations which um, were Victorian 19th century, but very often they were uh, quite largely stripped of their original features. So there was something about the space that took you back to the time uh, but there was also something which was just the opposite. Um, so, um, and, 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 and the other place which I really struggled to find was a, a mental asylum, obviously they no longer exist um, uh, as institutions as such. Very often they were turned into uh, flats and that happened, uh, that, was the, um, that was what happened with the main building of the asylum where Sophie died. The rest of it was consumed by fire at the beginning of the, I think, um, 2000s. Um, but there is, um, there is a, an incredibly well-preserved um, uh, mental asylum very close to Wallingford, which, um, again, is turned into flats, but they literally left all the features. Um, and, and, and it's very beautifully located quite close to the river. Um, uh, and I went for walks with a local historian who wrote about the space and how it's... Uh, how it functioned. Uh, so I use that um, as, as, as one of my locations for, for, for the kind of elder, uh, or late part um, of, of the project. Um, and there was also, um, the, I traveled, obviously I went to all these locations, but very often the place where Sophie stayed did not exist, apart, obviously apart from the New York one and her last home uh, in uh, Wharton uh, uh, and the Edge. So, um, I use Manor House near Whitney, uh, which um, uh, obviously was occupied by a quite wealthy family. It's now a museum, but that kind of made me think of how it must have been for Sophie to have her, you know, her room somewhere at the back, very close to children's bedrooms, um, and 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 live there. Um, there are some images which were taken uh, in Poland. And then I was trying to, um, obviously I was very, very much struck by her emotional, by the emotional impact of her, of her prose. Um, and I really wanted to, to kind of um, reimagine her characters, um, which were very often Sophie's alter egos. Um, so that image, which is there at the beginning um, of a woman tangled in a curtain veil, I just felt that that kind of sets the scene really well because that's Sophie in her own domestic environment where she could not, um, where her role was very much restricted and obviously she could not uh, pursue any um, uh, any other um, uh, career for her. Um, her, mom, her mother was very clear that you know, she had to get married, you know, obviously nothing came, came uh, of it. And very often the, the female characters in her prose they are there in the domestic settings and they're quite trapped, you know, they often look out at the world um, outside thinking, you know, there must be some uh, opportunities, there must be some possibilities, and they do try, uh, but more often than not they fail. Um, uh, and, and obviously, because of the kind of uh, tragic aspect of it, there was a lot of dark, um, lots of blackness in the, in the images, but that's obviously done, done, done uh, on purpose to kind of evoke that uh, idea of you know, life coming to an end unfulfilled. However, because so, so Sophie had so much writing, so in a way, you know, despite the fact that she did not manage to establish herself as a writer in her own right, um, I think there was, you know, that there was so much to discover. 
Um, so hence, when I was working, so I always found that book projects will be the will, will be the a really good way of encapsulating and and preserving uh, the research that I've done, and also Sophie's text. Because as you can see, they are they are quite difficult to, to read. So in the, when I was working with Victoria Forrest, who's the book designer on the book, um, I felt very strongly that we should keep the text, um, and we did it in these little inserts throughout, throughout the book um, on the yellow pages. Yellow was also important for me because there was a saying in Polish to have yellow papers, which means to have been admitted to a mental asylum. Um, so they must have kept uh, files, uh, medical files of um, uh, psychiatric hospital patients with probably yellow folders or something, and hence the same. Um, and obviously that resembles the archive. Um, I wanted to give everyone a sense of the fact that she was a triangle writer, so most of the text is in English, but there are some poems in French and a little short story in Polish. Um, there's one page which is upside down, which is on purpose, because very often we're going through her, <laughs> going through her archive, and, which is not catalogued yet, unfortunately. So you'll come across one piece, which will be a receipt, and bits of a novel, then an upside down uh, poem, and then something else. Uh, um, and then the book finishes with an essay, so I gave you like a short, uh, short version of Sophie's, Sophie's life, um, uh, but there is, there is there is more uh, in it. Um, I felt like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> so please do ask me questions. Finally, I wanted to show you something that I salvaged from the book uh, production process when I went to witness uh, the book being made. Um, um, so the, when, the, when, when all the pages are finalized, they, they truncate it um, into those big, uh, and place onto these big, big sheets where you have eight pages per sheet. And I, was, I really love the fact that here the ink spelled out, you know, was spilled <laughs> and it, it affected and I just felt it's quite fitting with the work, so I saved it. And then here's the, here's the image side of it, um, part of it, so obviously it's on a different paper. Um, so yeah, I was, really, I was really fascinated by how the completeness of the book gets <laughs> divided into little bits and then finally gets printed and then gets bound. Uh, found together. Um, the book is entitled I Also Find Windmills and, and it's a quote from Sophie. So at the very beginning, it's one of, in one of her notes, uh, she says, what do you think of Don Quixote? His character is a bit like mine and I also find windmills. And I felt this kind of idealism, you know, the fact that she really wanted, um, she really wanted to succeed but there was no opportunities, there were no opportunities for her. Uh, but still, at the same time, she felt that you know at some point there will be breakthrough and there will be better, um, better conditions for for in a society for women to uh, to live in, and you know that uh, definitely did uh, did change uh, enormously since uh, her lifetime. Um, and her writing is really beautiful, so I would really encourage you to <laughs> to have a look and listen to the listen to the extracts because Verity Kirk is, is an actress. Um, she's done an incredible incredible work. You know the way she enacted and impersonated Sophie's um, uh, Sophie's characters is really really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.